Hello, and welcome to Storytime for Grown-Ups. I'm Paul, a librarian from Avalon Library, which is part of LA County Library, and happy holidays! It's that time of year, and I thought everybody would like a little story time, a story time for grown-ups. Uh, let's start today with a story by Anton Chekhov uh, from the 19th century. Chekhov, Russian writer, wrote many, many short stories, and he's not especially known for Christmas stories, so this one actually has quite a bit of heft and nuance to it. I hope you like it. It's called At Christmas Time. What shall I write? said Igor as he dipped his pen in the ink. Vasilisa had not seen her daughter for four years. Her daughter, Yefimya, had gone after her wedding to St. Petersburg, had sent them two letters, and then sense uh, seemed to have vanished out of their lives. There had been no sight nor sound of her. And whether the old woman was milking her cow at dawn, or heating her stove, or dozing at night, she was always thinking one and the same thing. What was happening to Yevfemia? Whether she was alive out yonder? She ought to have sent a letter, but the old father could not write, and there was no one to write the letter. But now Christmas had come, and Vasilisa could not bear it any longer, and went to the tavern to Igor, the brother of the innkeeper's wife, who had sat in the tavern doing nothing ever since he came back from the army. People said that he could write letters very well if he were properly paid. Vasilisa talked to the cook at the tavern, then to the mistress of the house, then to Igor himself. They agreed upon fifteen kopecks. And now, it happened on the second day of the holidays in the tavern kitchen. Igor was sitting at the table, holding his pen in his hand. Vasilisa was standing before him, pondering with an expression of anxiety and woe on her face. Pyotr, her husband, a very thin, old man with a brownish bald patch, had come with her. He stood, looking straight ahead, like a blind man. On the stove, a piece of pork was being braised in a saucepan. He was spurting and hissing, and seemed to be actually saying, bow, bow, bow. It was stifling. What am I to write? Igor asked again. What? said Vasilisa, looking at him angrily and suspiciously. Don't worry me! You are not writing for nothing! No fear! You'll be paid for it! Come, write! To our dear son-in-law, Andre, and to our only beloved daughter, Euphemia, with our love, we send a low bow and our parental blessing abiding forever. Written. Fire away. And we wish them a happy Christmas. We are alive and well, and I wish you the same, please the Lord, uh, the Heavenly King. Vasilisa pondered and exchanged glances with the old man. And I wish you the same, please the Lord, the Heavenly King, she repeated, beginning to cry. She could say nothing more. And yet, before, when she lay awake thinking at night, it had seemed to her that she could not get all she had to say in a dozen letters. Since the time when her daughter had gone away with her husband, much water had flowed into the sea. The old people had lived feeling bereft, and sighed heavily at night as though they had buried their daughter. "'What does your son-in-law do in St. Petersburg?' asked Igor. "'He was a soldier, my good friend,' the old man answered in a weak voice. "'He left the service at the same time as you did. He was a soldier, and now, to be sure, he is at St. Petersburg in a hydropathic establishment. The doctor treats the sick with water, so he, to be sure, is a house porter at the doctor's.' Igor thought a little and began writing rapidly. At the present time, he wrote, since your destiny through your own doing allotted you to the military career, we counsel you to look into the code of disciplinary offenses and fundamental laws of the war office, and you will see in that law the civilization of the officials of the war office, he wrote, and kept reading aloud what was written, while Vasilisa considered what she ought to write, how great had been their want the year before, how their corn had not lasted even till Christmas, how they had to sell their cow. She ought to ask for money, ought to write that the old father was often ailing and would soon, no doubt, give up his soul to God. 
But how to express this in words? What must be said first and what afterwards? Take note. Igor went on writing. In Volume 5 of the Army Regulations, soldier is a common noun and a proper one. A soldier of the first rank is called a general, and the last a private. The old man stirred his lips and said softly, It would be all right to have a look at the grandchildren. What grandchildren? asked the old woman, and she looked angrily at him. Perhaps there are none. Well, but perhaps there are. Who knows? And thereby you can judge, Igor hurried on, what is the enemy without and what is the enemy within. The foremost of our enemies within is Bacchus. Bacchus. <laughs> Igor finished the letter. He got up, read the whole of it through from the beginning. The old man did not understand, but he nodded his head trustfully. That's all right. It is smooth. God give you health. That's all right. They laid on the table three five kopeck pieces and went out the tavern. The old man looked immovably straight before him as though he were blind, and perfect trustfulness was written on his face. But as Vasilisa came out of the tavern, she waved angrily at the dog and said angrily, Oh, the plague! The old woman did not sleep all night. She was disturbed by thoughts. And at daybreak she got up, said her prayers, went to the station to send off the letter. It was between eight and nine miles to the station. Part 2 Dr. B. O. Muzzleweiser's hydropathic establishment worked on New Year's Day exactly as on ordinary days. The only difference was that the porter, Andre, had on a uniform with new braiding. His boots had extra polish, and he greeted every visitor with a Happy New Year to you! Just at ten o'clock there arrived a general, one of the frequent visitors, and directly after him the postman. Andre helped the general off with his great coat and said, A Happy New Year to you, Your Excellency! Thank you, my good fellow. The same to you. And at the top of the stairs the general asked, nodding towards the door, he asked the same question every day and always forgot the answer, And what is in that room? The massage room, Your Excellency. When the general's steps had died away, Andre looked at the post that had come and found one addressed to himself. He tore it open, read it several times, then looking at the newspaper, he walked without haste to his own room, which was downstairs close by the end of the passage. His wife, Yefemia, was sitting on the bed, feeding her baby. Another child, the eldest, was standing by, laying its curly head on her knee. A third was asleep on the bed. Going into the room, Andre gave his wife the letter and said, From the country, I suppose. Then he walked out again, without taking his eyes from the paper. He could hear Euphemia with a shaking voice, reading the first lines. She read them, and could read no more. Those first lines were enough for her. She burst into tears, and hugging her eldest child, kissing him, she began saying, and it was hard to say whether she was laughing or crying, It's from Granny, from Grandfather, she said, from the country, the Heavenly Mother, saints and martyrs. The snow lies there, heaped under the roof now. The trees would be as white as snow. The boys slide on little sledges, and dear old bald grandfather is on the stove, and there is a yellow, little yellow dog. Oh, my own darlings! Andre, on hearing this, recalled that his wife had, on three or four occasions, given him letters, and asked him to send them to the country. But some important business had always prevented him. He had not sent them, and the letters somehow got lost. And little hares run about in the fields, Euphemia, was chanting, kissing her boy and shedding tears. Grandfather is kind and gentle. Granny is good, too, kind-hearted. They are warm-hearted in the country. They are God-fearing. The peasants sing in the choir. <sighs> Queen of Heaven, Holy Mother and Defender, take us away from here. Andre returned to his room to smoke a little till there was another ring at the door, and Euphemia ceased speaking, subsided, and wiped her eyes though her lips were still quivering. 
She was very much frightened of him. Oh, how frightened of him! She trembled and was reduced to terror by the sound of his steps, by the look in his eyes, and dared not utter a word in his presence. Andre lit a cigarette, but at that very moment there was a ring from upstairs. He put out his cigarette, and assuming a very grave face, hastened to the front door. The general was coming downstairs, fresh and rosy from his bath. Oh, and what is that room in there? he asked, pointing to the door. That is the massage room, Your Excellency. That is At Christmas by Anton Chekhov. A lot going on in that story. It would be interesting to know what the characters are actually thinking in there. At this time, we'll now turn to a brief passage from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, um, a lovely tale, full of color and excitement. Uh, I'm going to read the passage uh, that takes place when Scrooge is out and about with the ghost of Christmas present. And they've stopped off at the house of uh, Scrooge's clerk, Bob Cratchit, and uh, they're celebrating Christmas there. In came Tiny Tim, before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool before the fire. And while Bob, turning up his, call, his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons, and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with soon, with which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that she might have thought a goose was the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon to which a black swan was a matter of course. And in truth, there was something like that in the house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him to a little table in the corner. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for the goose before their turn came, uh, turn came to be helped. At last, the dishes were set on, Grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all around the table, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on his table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there was ever such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last. Yet everyone had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the backyard and stolen it while they were so merry with the goose a supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello! A great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other with a laundress, laundress's house next to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly with the pudding like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm and blazing in half a quatrain of ignited brandy, and bedlight with holly brandy stuck to the top. Oh, what a wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly, too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. 
Mrs. Cratchit said, now the weight was off her mind, she would confess she had some doubts as to the quantity of the flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. It would have been heresy to do so. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last, the dinner was all done, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up. The compound and the jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges put on the table. Then all the Cratchit family drew around the hearth, in which Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half a one, and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup. Mr. Scrooge! I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast, said Bob. The founder of the feast, indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, it's Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I am sure, said she, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you, poor fellow. Oh, my dear, was Bob's mild answer. Christmas Day! I'll drink his health for your sake, and the day's sake, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not for his. Long life to him, a Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. That was Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Now I'm going to try something a little different as the final bit. I'm going to try singing a song. So um, if it doesn't work out, and it might not, feel free to just shut this computer off. You know, you may just want to give it a hard shut off if you uh, can't stand it. Uh, and because I've got such a lousy voice, I'm going to rely upon my puppet for this. Hello! You might have, puppets are sort of my crutch. So this is going to be uh, a song by Tom Lehrer, the comedic uh, songwriter of the 60s. Uh, he recently announced that he wanted all his stuff, all everything he's written, to be in public domain, which means anybody can use it uh, you know, for any purpose, uh, including story time for grown-ups. So um, he wrote a song called Christmas, and uh, it's uh, a little dark. Uh, please be aware that the sentiments uh, that appear in the song do not necessarily represent the sentiments of L.A. County in any shape, way, or form. But here we are. <clears throat> Christmas time is here by golly! Disapproval would be folly. Deck the halls with hunks of holly. Fill the cups and don't say when. Kill the turkeys, ducks, and chickens. Mix the punch, drag out the dickens. Even though the prospect sickens, brother, here we go again. On Christmas Day, you can't get sore. Your fellow man, you must adore. There's time to rob him all the more. The other 364. Relations sparing no expensel, send some useless old utensil, or a matching pen or pencil, just the thing I need, how nice. It doesn't matter how sincere it is, nor how heartfelt the spirit, sentiment will not endear it, what's important is the price. Oh dear, that's terrible, isn't it? Hark the Herald and Tribune sings, advertising wondrous things. God rest ye merry merchants, may you make the yuletide pay. Angels we have heard on high, tell us to go out and buy. So let the raucous sleigh bells jingle. Hail our old friend, Chris Kringle, driving his reindeer across the sky. Don't stand underneath when they fly by. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us for this installment of Storytime for Grown Ups. Hopefully, the next time I will not be wearing this hat. I wish you all happy holidays from LA County and Avalon Library.